China, a country with a population of over 1.4 billion people, has only ever qualified for one World Cup in 2002, where they lost all three games, conceded nine goals, and failed to score a single one. Uruguay, on the other hand, a country of just 3.4 million people, which equates to a mere 0.24% of China's population, has qualified for a whopping 14 FIFA World Cups, reaching the last four on five occasions, and winning two of them. There are lots of reasons why some countries are better than others at football. The level of interest is naturally one of the primary factors, with countries like India, China, and the USA, where football doesn't reign supreme, long having struggled. Government funding is another big factor, along with the number of registered coaches and pitches. Less tangible, but no less significant, seems to be the competence and the level of corruption within the National Football Association, its leagues, and at club level. Even accounting for all of those discrepancies though, and indeed population, some nations are just massive under and overachievers when it comes to the world's most popular sport, with various coherent and crackpot theories as to why that might be the case. With this in mind, I was recently planning a video on the best countries at football on a per capita or per head basis, i.e. the biggest overachievers relative to their size, before I got derailed by the biggest underachievers, entirely forgot what I was doing in the first place, and decided to make this instead. It happens a lot. Anyway, the overachievers will just have to wait for now, but without further ado, here are, in my view at least, the biggest underachievers in all of international football. 7th, Russia. We start with Russia, a country which undoubtedly should be better at football, though that is hardly their worst crime at this moment in time. That would be war crimes, just in case there was any ambiguity. Russia is a big old country. I don't know if you've looked at any globes or maps of the world recently, but it's absolutely massive, bordering Finland and even Poland to the west through the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad Oblast and China and North Korea to the east, and it is actually the easternmost country on Earth, thanks to Big Diomede Island, not far off the coast of Alaska. Russia is not very densely populated whatsoever, but it is still the ninth most populous nation on Earth overall, with just shy of 150 million inhabitants. That makes Russia the largest country in, or at least partially in Europe, yet whilst other populous European countries like Germany, France and England our relative football superpowers, Russia have been pretty rubbish at football ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, prior to which, naturally, they didn't compete as Russia at all, but as the USSR, with several of their best players hailing from what is now Ukraine, Georgia, and even Armenia. The USSR reached three World Cup quarterfinals and a semi-final between 1958 and 1970, and actually won the inaugural European Championships in 1960, as well as making the last four of the next three Euros in succession. Even in their last Euros as the USSR in 1988, the Soviet Union reached the final where they were only beaten by the brilliance of Marco van Basten and the Netherlands. The collapse of the Soviet Union spelt disaster for Russia though, and for many post-Soviet states, and football was one of many casualties. Contrary to popular belief, football is the most popular sport in Russia, though it faces fierce competition from ice hockey, and there is still a great commitment to the traditional Olympic and Winter Olympic sports. Russia's population is disparate, to put it mildly, and so is its football. Vast numbers of children are effectively cut off from training, coaching, and even a suitable surface upon which to play football. Enormous state resources have been pumped into Russian football, particularly over the last decade, but in all of the wrong areas. Wages have risen enormously in Russia's top flight since the 1990s, yet the standard has somehow got progressively worse. Domestic players saw no reason to leave Russia, since they could earn more there than elsewhere, thus not testing themselves in Europe's top leagues. Meanwhile, expensive foreigners did little to raise the overall standard, 
where money would have been far better spent on grassroots facilities, outreach, and coaching. Russia reached the quarterfinals of their own World Cup in 2018, buoyed on by their home support, but they didn't win a single game at the 2014 World Cup, they failed to qualify in 2010 and in 2006, and they have failed to get out of their groups at each of the last three Euros. Things have gone from bad to worse for Russian football now though, cut off from the rest of the world due to their FIFA and UEFA suspensions, their only fixtures in 2022, coming against Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. The fact that they only won one of those three games should tell you all that you need to know about the degree to which Russian football has, and continues to underachieve. Sixth, China. India and China, the two most populous nations in the world by some distance, both made my 13 country shortlist for this video, and I flip-flop between including both of them, neither of them, or one of the two. In the end, I settled solely on China, primarily because China doesn't have another mass participation team sport like India does with cricket. China has invested an absolute fortune in recent years, again, unlike India in football, and it is a much richer country both in overall terms and on a per capita basis. Depending on which criteria you use, football is somewhere between the second and fourth most popular sport in China, competing with the likes of basketball, table tennis, and badminton. Chinese President Xi Jinping is a self-styled football fan, and the Chinese Communist Party set out an ambitious three-point plan for football in 2016. The first goal for 2020 was to have built 20,000 training centres and 70,000 new pitches, the second, for 2030, was to have one of the best men's teams in Asia, capable of competing with the likes of South Korea and Japan, and the last, targeted for the year 2050, was for China to host the World Cup and to have one of the best men's teams in the world, capable of going all the way. The CCP has been famous for its successful central planning for the last three or four decades, but it would appear that conquering the world of football is a little bit more challenging than conquering the world of manufacturing, and perhaps slightly less of a priority. China's rapid acceleration of investments into football, both at home and abroad, had already begun to slow down by 2018, and the taps abroad at least were effectively shut off in 2020. The Chinese Super League, which was briefly the highest spending division in all of world football, has since virtually collapsed, with several of its leading teams either having been relegated or dissolved. China's men's team, meanwhile, is quite spectacularly terrible, and has actually gotten worse rather than better, despite all of the investments in recent years. I mentioned China's World Cup record in the introduction, but China have never even won the AFC Asian Cup or the Asian Games, they lost games against Oman and Vietnam in 2022, and they rank below Iceland in the FIFA World Rankings. Just to put that into some context, as many people are born in China every week as the total population of Iceland. Given the efforts that have been made, the futility of them up to this point, and the sheer size of China, I felt that they simply had to feature. Fifth, Ethiopia. If I asked you all to tell me one thing about Ethiopian football, I suspect that somewhere in the region of 98% of you would struggle. Better known for its coffee, culture, and sadly conflict than for its football, if people know about it at all, we should all take much more interest in Ethiopia, given that it is all of our ancestral homelands. The earliest ancestors of humankind were discovered by archaeologists in modern-day Ethiopia, from which Homo sapiens diverged a few hundred thousand years ago before spreading out all around the world. Not everyone left, though, and there are still 105 million people who call Ethiopia home, making it the second-largest nation in Africa by population, the 13th most populous in all the world, and the 6th or 7th most populous, in which football is the most popular sport. Despite having more inhabitants than Egypt or Germany though, 
and an immense passion for football, Ethiopia's achievements within the sport, particularly in recent decades, have been utterly abysmal. It wasn't always thus. At the inaugural African Cup of Nations in 1957, Ethiopia were one of just three countries to compete, and they won the tournament as hosts in 1962. Since the 60s, however, Ethiopia have only qualified for the AFCON four times, once as hosts, failing to get out of the group stage on a single occasion, and not even having won a single game since their last tournament as hosts in 1976. Ethiopia have also never qualified for the World Cup, despite much smaller African countries like Togo and Senegal having done so. Ethiopia is one of the world's poorest countries, plagued by ongoing civil armed conflicts, which perhaps explains why football is in such a sorry state. In recent years, football stadiums have become battlegrounds, figuratively speaking, in most instances, as a proxy for the country's political divisions, with the country's Premier League football teams representing provinces often drawn down ethnic lines. Even given all of Ethiopia's doubtless significant challenges though, to be ranked 138th in the world, behind the Solomon Islands and the Faroe Islands, the latter with a population of just 50,000 people to Ethiopia's 105 million is atrocious and it meant that the East African nation simply had to feature. Fourth, Turkey. The top four in this seven is where things get really serious, with four countries who ought to be powerhouses on the international stage, but are anything but. Turkey is a country where Europe meets Asia, but in football terms, Turkey is a UEFA member. In terms of population, Russia, who are currently suspended by FIFA and UEFA, is the only country bigger than Turkey in UEFA, and football faces far less competition for sporting supremacy in Turkey than it does in Russia, with basketball being the country's second most popular sport, and a distant second at that. Indeed, Turkey is one of the most football-obsessed nations on the planet, featuring four professional men's leagues, one women's, and three of the best supported clubs on the continent in Galatasaray, Fenerbahce, and Besiktas, all concentrated in Turkey's biggest city of Istanbul. Unfortunately, the management, or mismanagement of Turkish football, and some even claim the excessive passion, has been to the detriment of domestic players, and therefore the national team. I made a documentary not all that long ago about the downfall of Turkish football at the national and international level over the last couple of decades, in which some of the key factors include overspending, often in all of the wrong areas, political interference, and broader economic factors. Turkey's biggest clubs have been woefully mismanaged for an awfully long time, and are all guilty of chronic short-termism, preferring to throw vast sums of money at aging foreign players than developing their own homegrown talent. It's not as though Turkey doesn't produce talented young players, though there are some problems there too, it is that those players are treated as an afterthought by their clubs, who would rather win three points at the weekend than a title, and compete in Europe in five years' time. That hasn't just been to the detriment of Turkey's national team, which ranks 44th in the world, below Norway, Ecuador and Scotland, but also to those clubs themselves and to the league as a whole, which now ranks 12th in UEFA's league coefficients, below the top flights in Scotland, Austria and Serbia. We have seen what Turkish-born or players of Turkish descent, like Ilkay Gundogan, Mehmet Scholl and Mesut Ozil, can achieve when properly nurtured in other countries, and it is little wonder that some of Turkey's best players in recent years, like Nuri Sahin and Hakan Çelenoglu, were born and trained at youth team level outside of Turkey as well. If you look at the top five goal scorers in the Turkish Super League so far this season, you won't find a single Turkish player. Until that is addressed, the Turkish Football Federation becomes a cleaner and more competent institution. Top Turkish teams are ridded of maniacal presidents who think that they need Galactico-style signings every summer, and the press stops building Turkish youngsters up seemingly with the sole purpose of eventually knocking them down five times as hard, 
Then despite a population of 85 million people being UEFA members and having an insatiable appetite for the sport, very little is likely to change. It is interesting that Turkey have only qualified for one World Cup since 1954, in 2002, yet they made it all the way through to the semis and finished third. They came third again at Euro 2008, but they were hopeless at Euro 2020, having been a lot of people's dark horses at that tournament, and indeed, for most of their history, barring the exceptions of 2002 and 2008. Third. Nigeria. Nigeria is the third largest country in Africa by population, it has the highest overall GDP, and football is practically a state religion. Yet at the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, the Super Eagles were nowhere to be found. Following decades of underachievement, Nigeria enjoyed a golden generation during the 1990s, winning the African Cup of Nations and qualifying for their first World Cup in 1994. Nigeria had an exhilarating team at that time, starring the likes of Daniel Amakachi, Fanidi George, Rashidi Yakini, and JJ Okocha, and they made it through to the quarterfinals before falling to Italy in extra time. Since then, Nigeria's population has doubled, and with an average age of 18, they have a vast pool of players. Yet, Nigeria ranks below fellow sub-Saharan national teams like Senegal and Cameroon in the FIFA World Rankings, both of whom qualified for the 2022 World Cup, despite having roughly 10% of Nigeria's population. It probably doesn't help matters, to put it mildly, that Nigeria's football federation is considered to be one of the most corrupt and incompetent anywhere in the world, and the country's poor quality coaching and infrastructure has most likely let countless potential superstars slip through the net, purely due to negligence. As with Turkey, many of Nigeria's best players didn't come through the youth ranks of Nigerian clubs at all. Throughout Europe, we see players of Nigerian descent like Jamal Musiala, Bakayo Saka and David Alaba, starring for the German, English and Austrian national teams, whilst players born in Nigeria are so often denied the same opportunities. It is a crying shame and an enormous waste, as Nigeria has a larger population than Brazil, a younger average age, and a wellspring of talent. Whilst we have seen little in the way of improvement when it comes to corruption and domestic league infrastructure in recent years, there are several academies that have been opened in Nigeria by European clubs like FC Midtjylland, Roma and Barcelona, along with those founded by former players like Nwanku Kanu's Papilo Football Academy, and having an inspirational figure like Victor Osimen becoming one of the best centre forwards in the world right now, ought to give a real lift not just to the current Nigeria team of course, but to future generations as well. Second, Indonesia. Indonesia has gone from being a country I had almost entirely overlooked on this channel until recently, to one that I've made two videos about in the past month alone, and which now features second in this seven. The first of those two videos, which is entitled The Most Dangerous Football League in the World, explains most of the problems which have long plagued Indonesian football and Indonesian society in general. Those include violence, sectarianism, and endemic corruption in what is the fourth most populous nation on earth, behind only China, India, and the United States. That makes Indonesia the largest country, by population, in which football is the most popular sport. To say that Indonesians are passionate about football would be an understatement so gross as to be almost insulting. Indonesians live and breathe football, yet, as in so many ways, the country has been terribly betrayed. Indeed, Indonesia has only ever qualified for the World Cup once, in 1938, when the country was still a colony of the Netherlands, named the Dutch East Indies. That made Indonesia the first Asian country to feature at the World Cup, but they lost their only game, and the closest they have come to qualifying since then was in 2002, when they still finished six points behind China in the first qualifying round of a weaker than usual AFC qualifying campaign, by virtue of South Korea and Japan qualifying for the World Cup automatically, as joint hosts. 
Not only have Indonesia failed to qualify for the World Cup since 1938, they've never won the AFF Championship, which is hardly the creme de la creme of international football. They've never got out of the group stage of the AFC Asian Cup, and they haven't even qualified since 2007. It should be said, unlike with Turkey, Nigeria, and the country up next in top spot, Indonesia isn't surrounded by countries that do routinely qualify and reach the knockout stages of the FIFA World Cup. But even their near neighbours, Malaysia, the Philippines, and most notably Vietnam, rank above them in the FIFA World Rankings, despite, in Malaysia's case, having a population which is just an eighth of the size of Indonesia's. First, Mexico. The number one underachieving nation in all of world football, at least as far as I'm concerned, and particularly now and in recent decades, simply has to be Mexico. Mexico has all of the ingredients to be one of the best national teams on earth. It has a huge population of almost 130 million people, making it almost three times the size of reigning world champions Argentina. It is located in Latin America, a hotbed of world-class talent and World Cup winners like Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil, and it has a hugely popular, well-established, and highly competitive domestic top flight in the form of Liga MX. Is Mexico and Mexican football corrupted in some ways? Is poverty a significant problem? And is there a huge issue with violence and crime? Yes, yes, and yes to all of the above, of course. But the same could be said of Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil, with only really the last of those three being more of an issue in Mexico than for any of the other three. Of course, the major difference between Mexico and the likes of Argentina and Brazil in a football context is that Argentina and Brazil are CONMEBOL members, the South American Football Confederation, whilst Mexico are members of CONCACAF, the North American Association. Both are pretty mental and have been riddled with corruption in different ways, but unlike in CONMEBOL, where nearly every team is competitive, CONCACAF has long been a weak confederation in which Mexico face little competition outside of friendlies and at the World Cup. Now that has changed, with Canada and the United States both becoming emerging forces on the world stage, which presents both a risk and an opportunity to Mexican football, and quite frankly, if it turns out to be the former, they'll only have themselves to blame. Serial Gold Cup winners and three-time Copper America semi-finalists, when invited, Mexico have twice reached the quarterfinals as hosts of the World Cup in 1970 and in 1986, but they were banned from competing in 1990 and haven't got beyond the round of 16 since. The curse of seven successive round of 16 stage exits was finally broken in 2022, but only because Mexico exited at the group stage for the first time since 1978, their only win coming against Saudi Arabia after they had already been eliminated. Mexico is the highest ranked national team in this seven, but still the biggest underachievers as far as I'm concerned, and there is even less evidence as far as I can tell, that they're likely to turn that around anytime soon than there is with a country like Nigeria. Those are my top seven, with very dishonorable mentions, for the likes of India, Egypt, England, Pakistan, DR Congo, the USA, and the Philippines. Honestly, seven or eight years ago, I would have been extremely tempted to include England, as the birthplace of football as we know it, with by far the biggest and richest league in the world, and one of the most populous countries in Europe, yet just one World Cup, and no European Championship titles to their name. Or our name, perhaps. I should say if I were being partisan. However, England reached the semi-finals of the 2018 World Cup, the final of Euro 2020, and were only very narrowly beaten by France at the 2022 World Cup, following a shocker of a penalty by Harry Kane, so they are performing roughly as one would expect at this moment in time. Thank you all very much as ever for watching though, I would like to know which countries you think should have featured, if you think there's any I've missed even from my dishonorable mentions, or if you would just order them differently, so let me know in the comments. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video, and make sure that you are subscribed, of course, 
goes without saying, and have notifications turned on for both this channel and my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens now. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at hitc 7 should you wish to do so, and very finally, I will apologise for the cold that I have if I sounded a bit weird in this video, but, you know, no rest for the wicked.